Good evening and welcome to our midweek service for the Southwest District here in the Minnesota Conference. It's good to have you with us and to join us tonight. And tonight my message is a voice of thunder. And we have pre-recorded this message because we have a funeral graveside service up in Artichoke tomorrow. We've been praying for Roy and Vivian as you might recall, Vivian had fallen and fractured her pelvis, and uh, they had to move into a nursing home facility. And just toward the end of last week, Vivian passed away. And so we are up in Artichoke tomorrow for that service. So we just want to, to have prayer and then go to our message tonight and we want to remember Roy Bailey and his family remember our family members our children our grandchildren those that are working in the medical facilities that have the challenges with the COVID-19 uh, with our church members that are going through their weekly treatments and their needs there, their special needs. We just pray for them and, and uh, for other medical issues that have been requested. And uh, some besides, there have been a, uh, others besides Roy that have lost loved ones and we want to remember their families in our prayers as well. And so let's bow our heads. Dear Father in heaven, we come to you here in the middle of the week to be refreshed and to learn more about you and your word. And we want to pause and, and remember these special requests in prayer. We just think of Roy and losing his wife Vivian and I pray you'll be with the service tomorrow, that it may be a blessing to him and his family that are coming together from locally and out of state. Pray that you'll be with them and bless them and make it a blessing tomorrow. Pray you'll be with Karen and me as we travel, that it'll be safe traveling. And we just uh, put everything in your, your care and keeping. We pray for our family members. We pray for our grandchildren and our, our children. We pray for those, Lord, that are in special need of your care right now and medical care, going through treatments and uh, special needs that go along with that. We pray that you'll be with others that have lost loved ones too. And Father, we want to especially remember our churches as they, they're, they're suffering from not being able to meet together. And, and um, we thank you that Wyndham has been able to, to begin to meet. Pray that you'll be with all of our members there. And Pipestone right now, I just want to especially remember them in our prayers as they are going through the process of planning to open this coming Sabbath on August 1st. And we just pray you'll be with them and give them your presence and your guidance and your wisdom and strength. It's a difficult time and a good, difficult challenge. And so we just uh, put all of these things in your care and keeping. We thank you for hearing us. We thank you for answering our prayer, for giving us the grace that we so much need. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we'll now go to our message for tonight entitled, The Voice of Thunder. Uh, this is a, a message from our series on the book of Revelation that I did uh, recently, and we'll be, we'll be having some more. Uh, 
in the, under in that subject. And uh, we invite you to join us uh, Sabbath morning, August the first at 11 a.m. Central Daylight Time for our church service. And at that time, we're going to have part three in our six-part series on the biblical message of salvation. And the title of our message will be The Three Musts of Conversion. We're going to be going to John chapter 3. That's where the, we find uh, John 3.16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The words of Jesus. And... The three musts that give us a clue to understanding what true conversion is. So we'll go to our message at this time. And God bless you. And we'll look forward to seeing you again soon. My message today is a voice of thunder. The Spirit says, Come. I want to go back to the first gospel invitation in the Gospels, back in the Gospel of John. When John the Baptist was preaching and baptizing down at the Jordan River, many disciples had joined him down there at the Jordan, and it had been revealed to John the Baptist that he would recognize the Messiah when he came because he would see the Spirit descending like a dove. So one day, he was with the disciples, and he shouted out, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And then the next day, he was with his disciples, and he saw Jesus walking by, and he said to him, he said to them, Behold, the Lamb of God. And so two of those disciples, Andrew and John, went to follow the Lamb of God. And Jesus detected that they were following him, and he, he turned around and, and he said, what are you looking for? And they replied, Rabbi, tell us where you are staying. And Jesus said, come, and you will see. There we have the first gospel invitation. And then Jesus found another one of their friends, Philip, and he said, follow me. And Andrew went and found Peter, and Peter came and followed him. And then Philip went to Nathaniel, and he said, Nathaniel, we have found the one that Moses and the prophets talk about. We have found the Messiah. His name is Jesus of Nazareth. And Nathaniel, and Nathaniel's face fell, and he said, Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And Philip said, Come and see. Again, the gospel invitation is, Come and see. It's the first gospel invitation given in the New Testament. But now, we go to another gospel invitation that is in the book of Revelation. It's the invitation from the throne. And it's the same invitation. Here is the throne room of the universe pictured in Revelation 4 and 5. Of course, this is just my stick drawing of the throne room of the universe. The actual throne room is much more glorious and beautiful which could not even be pictured. But here it is in symbol. The Father is seated on the throne, and next to him is that new covenant scroll, sealed with its seven seals. And surrounding the throne are four cherubim, one with the face of a lion, another with the face of a bull, one with the face of a man, and the other with the face of an eagle. And in front of this throne are seven flames of fire, which represent the Holy Spirit. And then we see the 24 elders seated before the throne. 
And then there are thousands of thousands and myriads of myriads of angels surrounding the throne. And in Revelation 6, we find that each one of these cherubim is connected with the horse. The first one with the face of a lion is connected with the white horse. The second one with the face of a bull or calf is connected with the red horse. The third one with the face of a man is connected with the black horse. And the fourth one with the face of an eagle or a vulture is connected with the pale or sickly green horse. And these four angels also give the gospel invitation. Then I saw, this is in Reve Revelation 6, verse 1, Then I saw when the Lamb broke one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures, the one with the face of a lion, saying, as with a voice of thunder, Come! Have you ever been to the zoo and you hear a lion roar? It has that sound like thunder. Come! And some early manuscripts say, come and see, picking up from the invitation in John's gospel. And the tense is imperative, second person singular. You come. And in verse 2, I looked and behold a white horse, and he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. So we need to ask the question, when the first cherubim shouts with the voice of thunder, come, who is he talking to? Well, he's talking to everyone who will listen on this earth. He's talking to us. And the second question is, come where? Well, come to the throne of grace where everything is prepared. Everything necessary for our eternal salvation is prepared. And all that is left to do is come. So then he, when he broke the second seal, I heard the second living creature, the one with the face of a bull or a calf, saying, Come! And another, a red horse, went out, and to him who sat on it, it was granted to take peace from the earth, and that men would slay one another, and a great sword was given to him. And when he broke the third seal, I heard the third living creature, the one with the face of a man, saying, Come! And I looked, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. Those are famine scales for measuring out bread in the time of famine. And I heard something like a voice in the center of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not damage the oil and the wine. Exorbitant prices in a time of famine. So after the white horse comes the sword, and then famine. And when the lamb broke the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature, that's the one with the face of an eagle or a vulture, saying, come. And I looked and behold an ashen, and literally it says a pale green, chloros is the word, where we get our word chlorophyll. Chlorine, pale green horse, a sickly green horse, and he who sat on it had the name Death. And Hades was following with him, and authority was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill, and then we, we review them all, to kill with a sword, and with famine, and with pestilence or death, and by the wild beasts of the earth. These four elements in Leviticus 26 are connected with the curse of the covenant. God had told Israel back in the beginning when they first came out of Egypt and were on the borders of the promised land. Yahweh said, if you are faithful to the covenant, 
I will bless you. You will go forth conquering and to conquer. But if you are unfaithful, unfaithful to the covenant, I will send the sword. Now, these curses are redemptive. They're not, uh, God is not saying, I'm going to get back at you because you did this. He's saying, if you're unfaithful, I'm going to send the sword. And if you're still unfaithful, I'm going to send the famine. And if you're still unfaithful, I'm going to send the pestilence and death and the wild beasts of the earth. But hopefully, they will be made faithful again and will go forth conquering and to conquer. So the gospel invitation comes from the throne. Come. Come where? Come to the Lamb who is standing as if slain with his seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth, Revelation 5 or 6. The picture on the right there captures the symbolism of the lamb with seven horns and seven eyes. But he's standing as, as if slain, so let's stand him up. It would be great if we could have a, an artist that could make this the way it was actually seen. But here we have the lamb standing as if slain. And the invitation is, come to the lamb who stands as if slain with his seven horns, which are the branches of the lampstand. You, you re may recall that horn, the word horn in the Hebrew language can mean beam of light or horn of an animal. So these are the seven beams of light emanating from the side of the lamb from those seven wounds of Calvary. And the seven lamps are the seven spirits of God that set their seven eyes of the lamb are the lamps which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. It says in the Old Testament, the eyes of Yahweh go to and fro throughout the earth, looking for those whose hearts are toward him, that he might strengthen them. So here is pictured the solution to all of our troubles. The lamb standing as if slain. Come. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. So choose life in order that you may live. By loving the Lord your God, by obeying his voice, and by beholding, by holding fast to him. For this is your life and the length of your days that you may live in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give them. From there, we want to go to the invitation to the Big Supper. Jesus was invited one Sabbath afternoon to dinner. He was the guest of honor. And everyone was jostling to get the highest seat around the table. And when everyone had settled down, Jesus said, when you go to a feast, don't try to sit the very best seat because someone more important might come in and the host might say to you, could you move over and make way for this person to sit down? And then you'll find yourself down at the foot of the table. But what you need to do, Jesus said, is sit, is sit at the foot of the table and then maybe the host might say, no, 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 you come up here and sit in a more honored position. And if you're the host, Jesus said, don't just invite your friends. Invite the blind and the lame and those who are really in need. Well, now the guests, the dinner guests, were beginning to feel a little uncomfortable because it was hitting a little too close to home. And somebody said, oh, how blessed it will be to be able to sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of God. Let's change the subject, shall we? Let's think of something more pleasant than the blind and the lame and those who are really in need. But he said to him, 
A man was giving a big dinner and he invited many. And at the dinner hour, he sent his slave to say to those who had been invited, come. Exactly the same word, come, for everything is ready now. Now, all of these instances of the word come are the same word in the same tense, the imperative, which is the command form. In Revelation, they're all in the second person singular. Here in Luke, they're in the second person plural, but it's the same word in the same tense. There are other words that are translated with the English word come, but all of these are translated from the same original word. Come, why? Everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first one said to him, oh, I have bought a piece of land and I need to go out and look at it. Please consider me excused. And another one said, I just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm, I'm, go I'm going to try them out. Please consider me excused. And another one said, I have married a wife and for that reason I cannot come. Are these all reasons or excuses? Excuses, miserable excuses. Imagine if, if Andrew had, uh, my friend Andrew had invited me to a special dinner with him and his family. And, and we had planned on this for, for days and weeks ahead. And uh, we were looking forward to this special date. And, and then Andrew sends me a, a text message. Everything's ready, come. And I said, oh, Andrew. I'm so sorry, but I just got in the mail, the UPS man brought me that drone that I ordered from Amazon, and I've just got to try it out. I'm sorry, I just can't come. All of these are miserable excuses, which really show that they didn't care much for the one who invited them. Mm -hmm. That certainly would be the idea that Andrew would have gotten if I had said that to him. And the slave came back and reported this to his master. And then the head of the household became angry and he said to his slave, go out at once into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in here the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. And the slave said, Master, what you commanded has been done, and still there is room. And the master said to the slave, Go out into the highways and along the hedges and compel them to come in so that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste of my dinner. And so the invitation was spurned. But now we have a personal invitation to come to the throne. Come, for everything is now ready. Every provision for our eternal life has been made in the Lamb, standing as though he had been slain. Full forgiveness for sin and power to overcome. It's all there. All you need to do is come. Everything has been made ready. And if we love him, we'll come. We won't make excuses about all the other things that we need to be doing. We'll come and make him first in our lives. The personal invitation is given seven times in the book of Revelation. We've looked at the first four. The lion says, come. The bull says, come. The man says, come. The eagle says, come. But there are three more. In the book of Revelation, we find them all in Revelation chapter 22. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty, come. And let the one who wishes take the water of life without cost. It's free. Just come. 
The door is open. Salvation is a free gift, and yet it is to be bought and sold. In the market of which divine mercy has the management, the precious pearl is represented as being bought without money and without price. In this market, all may obtain the goods of heaven. The treasury of the jewels of truth is open to all. Behold, I have set before you an open door, the Lord declares, and no man can shut it. No sword guards the way through this door. Voices from within and the door in and at the door say, Come. The Savior's voice earnestly and lovingly invites us, I counsel you to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that you may be rich. Come. Come to the supper. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. John 6, 35 to 40. And don't be afraid that you're not going to be worthy when you do come, that he won't accept you. Jesus says, the one who comes, I will certainly, <coughs> the one who comes, I will certainly not cast out. This is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. John 6, 35 to 40. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him, everyone who what? Beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. How's that for a promise? Do you want to come? Do you want to respond to that invitation, that personal invitation, the invitation to the throne of grace? Come, for everything is now ready. Shall we bow our heads? Dear Father in heaven, we're so thankful for the invitation to come. And we're so thankful for the lamb standing as though he had been slain. Jesus, the light of the world, the one who represents us perfect before your throne. We thank you for the invitation to come so that we may receive all the gifts that you want to give us. And we pray that as we come, we will be enabled to do what we couldn't do otherwise to love you with all our hearts and love our neighbors ourselves. And many others will be able to respond as well to the gospel invitation as we join in inviting others to come. We thank you for hearing and answering our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>